Hello everybody, Cal Banyan here, Cal Banyan's Hypnosis Etc. If you're watching this video anywhere except calbanyan.com, you want to go there right now because on calbanyan.com, right below this video, we have additional text, links, and graphics that just support this video and makes it more valuable to you. All right. Gosh, I'm so excited. This is the episode number four about the secret language of feelings, and it's all Brenda's fault. She talked me into talking about it, and uh, I knew I could go on and on and on, and I didn't know if I could ever get it done in, in, in just four episodes, but we're doing it. We're hitting the, the highest points. Um, you know, certainly it's not equivalent to getting the book. That's why we're pointing you over to thesecretlanguageoffeelings.com, where I have some free audios there that you can listen to and get a much deeper sense of what's going on. Ah, let me tell you about Brenda, co-host. I'll tell you what, she is a hypno one percenter. She is a hypnotherapist in our office. I know she's good because not only does she talk the talk, I mean we talk between sessions and I, she knows what she's talking about, but she walks the walk. She sees clients here every week. She gets referrals and she's very excited to be a part of this profession. She's got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. She was in talk therapy before, and now she's getting stuff done so much more powerfully. How you doing, Brenda? I'm doing great, Cal. I uh, I love when we say that I'm, I'm excited, but I am so happy. Uh, oh my gosh, if I ever would have thought two years ago, right now, that I would be just doing this work and working for myself, working for my clients, working here, I never would have believed it, but I'm thrilled to be here. And I was just so fortunate that when my life took a turn that I lived down the street from the Banyan Hypnosis Center. I came here, I got trained by Cal. I learned five path hypnotherapy from the one who developed the whole system. I uh, was able to learn seventh path self hypnosis, which I use uh, very regularly on myself as well as with my clients, teaching them that mind body spirit connection to really help uh, just really solidify all of the work that we are doing here. It's just incredible. And, you know, like I've shared, just actually working with the sacred language of, I was, I started to say the sacred language of feelings. So I realized that I would stop myself and be sure, because I actually do really feel that uh, this, the secret language of feelings has been an incredible blessing for uh, myself in my life as well as just everybody that I've ever talked to about it. And uh, so I'm really thrilled today that we're going to do a little bit more of that digging deeper, talking about the secret language of feelings. So before we hit that topic, uh, Cal, do you have any news or any other things that you'd like to share before we hit this ground running? Boy, just uh, I think we need to save every second for the content of, of this topic because we've got to wrap it up with this video. Excellent. Well, today, you know, we have this is our fourth uh, uh, final in a series of four talking about the secret language of feelings. And, you know, we've talked about how it can help you in your hypnosis practice, what feelings are for and the wisdom of fear, the feel bad distract cycle. So if you haven't seen those episodes, please go check them out. Be sure to look at all of the links down below. Uh, listen to the audios about the secret language of feelings. Order the books. Order, oh my gosh, I buy them by the caseload because people walk in, I give them out like candy because I just believe in it that much that I just think it's like so valuable in getting people to talk about feelings. So the reality is that when we talk about the secret language of feelings, very much the way that Cal teaches uh, is by doing. And so how we learn even the secret language of feelings in uh, when we're doing certification is by him, you know, actually leading by example. And so when he's teaching five path, he's teaching seventh path, uh, we are learning by experiencing some of his techniques. And so I realize that there's so much depth to working with the secret language of feelings that I learned more just from talking to Cal. And so since I get to talk to Cal in the break room, I like to bring some of those discussions out here into the the podcast to be able to help all of you guys. And so one day, I think I was just frustrated with 
what I was able to do with a client and Cal starts asking me these questions and when I started employing some of these questions into my practice that I hadn't don't think I saw anywhere else except for really talking to him I probably did in certification but it just started really bringing things home for me so when I proposed that we talk about the secret language of feelings I used this topic as an example and I said, well, they're, you know, the digging deeper questions, and I didn't know what to call them, and he called them the uncovering phrases. So, you know, our work, we're kind of the archaeologists. We are digging deeper with our clients, and so we're going to talk today about these uncovering phrases. So, Cal, here we go. What do you want to know specifically? Well, I was hoping we could talk about a couple of these and talk about how they can be utilized. So uh, why don't we start with, the, with, um, with sadness. We talk about how sadness is about something, somebody lost a thing or a person that is important to them. Never occurred to me until really Cal and I were talking and, and he brought up the question. Cal, what's the question for sad? Well, see, this, the thing behind this, the backstory is that, you know, here we are, we're saying, you gotta learn the secret language of feelings. You gotta understand what feelings mean and the cause of feelings. And then, you know, as I teach over and over again in our age regression uh, videos and also in class and also on uh, the Five Path uh, 2.0 video uh, certification set is that there's, when you do an age regression, there's five things you gotta learn from every event. You gotta find out what's happening. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? How old are you? And is that feeling familiar or new? Now, there's a problem with that. Our clients stink at talking about feelings. You ask them, what are you feeling? And they'll, they'll start telling you what you, they, they're thinking. Or they'll, they'll mix up their feelings and stuff like that. So sometimes I get around asking those questions directly. So instead of saying, what are you feeling? Because they're probably going to mess that up anyway. I'll say, let's say they're five or they're three years old in the regression. I go, okay, little one, what do you want, little one? And when they tell me what they want, they're telling me both, what are they thinking? Because they're thinking, I want mom or I want to be held, or I want to be safe, or I want to feel good about myself. And then what they're thinking tells me what they're feeling, okay? So <laughs> that's the other way you can do it. Remember one, two, three, A, B, C? What are you feeling? What's the cause? The cause is always what they're thinking. So like with sadness, as Brenda was asking about, if they look sad, and I go, what do you want, okay? And I might say that, so what are you feeling? They might say, I want, I want my mommy, or I want my puppy, okay? Why do you want your, your mommy or puppy? Because they're gone, you see? Sadness always comes from the perception of loss. Um, sometimes they will say, I'll say, what are you feeling? And they'll say, I feel sad, okay? Now, I'm looking at the, the whole situation in a holistic, gestaltic kind of way. I'm looking at the background, I'm looking at the foreground, I'm looking at it contextually. What's happening? So there's some event that's going on. In, in a previous podcasts, I talk about X happens. You give it M, meaning, and then that leads to an emotion, which leads to a feeling, which then leads to a behavior, okay? So when, when they, if they're in a situation where any normal, rational person would think something bad's gonna happen, they're in danger, and they say, I am sad. Well, now I'm going, this doesn't compute. Danger, something bad's going to happen, should be, make them feel fearful. But sometimes, because of 
uh, misunderstanding of the child or the context in which the child is being raised. Um, for example, maybe it's a little boy and little boy's been taught, you should never be afraid. You should always be courageous and fearless. Well, that child's not going to want to say, I'm afraid. So the child might say, I'm sad. So I can do a quick reality test in the middle of the session by saying, so you're feeling sad, what did you lose? You see? And when they say, I didn't lose anything, then we know it's not sadness. But if they say, I lost my mom, or I lost uh, my puppy, or I lost uh, mommy loving me, then I validate the emotion. Does that kind of make sense, Brenda? Definitely, yes. And I just think it's such a different way to open them up to sharing and getting down to the feeling and what's actually what they're thinking about it. Right. So once we understand that all emotions come from our perceptions, um, I don't have, I'll put a graphic below, but the X happens, something happens, we give meaning to it, and that, that's what we're thinking, and then our thoughts lead to emotions, and the emotions, we don't even really know what we're feeling I mean, we don't really know what emotion is going on inside of ourselves until we feel it in the body. So emotions are kind of like chemical, and then um, what, how that chemical or, or electro, elect, electrical response in the nervous system, how it is felt in the body is the feeling. For example, fear, thinking X happens, the meaning is, uh-oh, something bad might happen, and then you have the emotion inside, like adrenaline, and then you feel it in the body, like in the form of anxiety, and then that anxiety is there to motivate you to behave in a certain way so that you can either react or respond to the situation in a way that is satisfying. If it's fear and danger, then you need to be seeking uh, safety, security, through either avoidance or preparation. Let me see. Ah, boy, it's hard to squeeze all this in such a short period of time. I know. Yeah. Well, Cal, if we were to run over, what would happen? Huh. What would happen is people would would say, this video is too long. I'm never, I'm, at, or some people might go, wow, this is like extra cool. Bonus, right? Longer. See? See? Yeah. Exactly. So I really want to talk about one of my favorite uncovering phrases, which is that what could happen um, when I'm, you know, dealing with somebody and we're getting down to that fear and asking them what could happen. That's another one of those great uncovering phrases. In addition to what do you want and what do you lose that I just love. So what would you like to add about what could happen? Well, the, particularly, you know, when, when you've got someone regress the childhood state, and they go, uh, I'm scared. You go, well, what might happen? And they'll go, well, mommy might not come back. And then I say, and then what might happen? See, now I'm like peeling the layers of the onion. I'm drilling down into the base thought, the base emotion, the most fundamental thing that's going on, even perhaps at a genetic or instinctual level. So mommy's gone. Well, then what might happen if she's gone? Well, she might not come back. And if she doesn't come back, then what might happen? Well, there'd be nobody to, to take care of me. And then what might happen? Well, nobody would be there to feed me. And then what might happen? Well, then then I would I would be hungry and I'd get skinny. And, and, and then what might happen? And I might die. And so so we uncover this very, very basic level of fear. And it boils down to this, uh, this you know, so, um, genetic, fundamental, existential uh, emotion of, am I going to die? Now, one of the coolest things about this is whenever you're doing age aggression, you have absolute proof right there with you that they will not die because you've got grown up who can say, hey, little one, three, however old the, the regressed child is, guess what? We don't die. And it's like, ah, oh. and it just is that great reality check that shifts everything. And wow, it's so transformative. Is that what you're getting at? Yes, mm -hmm. it is. It, it is truly transformative, especially, you know, that reality check of really, you know, and I think especially with what might happen or what could happen, you just keep drilling it down. Okay, 
and then what could happen or what might happen and it really just peels everything away and I've had some really great success specifically with this phrase with with a variety of things but especially when I'm dealing with some performance anxiety issues uh, where they get down to this well I could I I could succeed or I could fail, you know, and it's so interesting to see people get to that, you know, what, what down, deep down the what could happen or the what might happen. So I really wanted to share that one because I think that's probably, and you know, and I do use this with uh, children in my life already and people in my life when they start, you know, just not even in hypnosis. Okay. So what could happen? You know, and it's like, you know, and, and, quite frankly, my husband will use it on me too because he knows it's my trick and he knows that it will work. So I just think it's such a valuable phrase to really start breaking down that fear so that people can bust forward and not be living in, in a fear-based life any longer. So that was probably one of my biggest inspirations for really talking about the secret language of feelings over these last few weeks was that really working with that phrase, what might happen, what could happen, but also, like I said, that um, what did you lose and what do you want, um, they are amazing ways of really breaking things down and digging deeper beyond the original great five questions that we ask in age regression or in any other work. You know, as you're talking about that, there's another thing that, that comes up that you, you're talking about, you know, as you're talking about your husband using it. So obviously it's not just something we would use for age regression or uh, forgiveness work or parts work, but it's also something we can do uh, just in normal waking consciousness, working with the secret language of feelings. Exactly. And, exactly. And one of the things that when I was in graduate school, my master's thesis was on things that facilitate self-disclosure. Now, at the time, I was working with how computer interaction, faceless computer interaction, like back then it was bulletin board systems, but now it could be any kind of um, network or, or like our hypnospace, that people get very revealing when they have a level of anonymity. Now, where does this get into this? So what happens is, as I was doing my literature review for, you know, what facilitates self-disclosure, talking about yourself and, and, and even more personal things about yourself, I also learned about what inhibits self-disclosure. And one of the main things we do as helping professionals, who could be counselors, psychologists, uh, medical people like doctors, and of course hypnotists, is we have to facilitate this self-disclosure. We need to find out, you know, what's going on inside. And what happens is, what it, the most general term, the thing that that inhibits self-disclosure is the fear of being judged negatively for what's going on inside of us. And because of that, when we ask people to self-disclose, what are you thinking, what are you feeling, they tend to give you the safest uh, response they can first. The one that they perceive, and this is especially true if they take a moment to think about it. You'll see those slow responders. You ask them a question and they kind of think about it. And they're trying to come up with a way to respond to that in a way that they're not going to be judged negatively. And so when we get into this kind of rapid fire drilling down technique of okay, good, then what might happen? Then what might happen? And how does that make you feel? And how does that make you feel? And how does that make you feel? Then what happens is you quickly get rid of the, the safe response. And if they trust you enough to, 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 to proceed to uh, self-reveal, to self-disclose, then you can drill down very quickly to where they're telling you stuff they've never told anyone before. Even in hypnosis, people can conceal what they think and what they feel if they fear of being judged negatively for it. And this is a, a, a rapid way to drill past those defenses and get to the core of the problem. Isn't that cool? It is excellent. All right, let's wrap it up. All right, well, thank you all for joining us on this journey into the secret language of feelings. I hope that it inspired you to 
dig deeper and learn more about the secret language of feelings, check out that audio series, check out the uh, book, take a look at the video that you can show your clients. I just can't speak highly enough about working with this in your hypnosis practice and also working with it in your life. So I look forward to uh, leave us questions, leave us comments, and I will be back uh, in the future for another series. We'll see what we decide to talk about next, but thanks so much everybody. And I will see you next time. Thank you so much, Brenda, for, you know, th these these co-hosts, they're wonderful. I mean, they don't get paid for this. Uh, they don't get rights to the video. They just do it for the benefit of the viewers. That's all there is to it. They get nothing out of it except for the, the, the feeling of having done something good for others. So thank you, Brenda, for taking the time of putting that together and uh, pushing me to, to cover this very, very important topic. All right, let's see. Does anyone want to say, um, gosh, I guess not. Let's just wrap it up with that. This is Cal Banyan signing off. This recording is the property of Cal Banyan and the Banyan Hypnosis Center for Training and Services Incorporated. All rights reserved for private use only may not be duplicated without permission. For contact information, go to www.hypnosiscenter.com.